everybody. Welcome back to our second episode of RIP Alive. I'm Mark Spencer, and I'm here with Steve Martin. How you doing, Steve? I'm great, Mark. Good to see you. And I see you're not in Starbucks this week. <laughs> That's right. Uh, for those of you who joined us, here from a big storm that came through and knocked us out, and I had to participate partly from Starbucks, but uh, everything's good now. I did have a internet go down half an hour ago, a little scary, but uh, we're up and running now, so uh, hopefully we can uh, marshal through here. <laughs> oh, okay, so a little bit about the show format. This is basically a tip show. So we show you a tip and then we take your questions. Now, this week we have quite the doozy to show you. Mark and I have been practicing for a few days. Uh, we had some questions last week about sharing collaboratively with somebody in another city or another country and a lot of a lot of questions about that so we're going to demonstrate mark and i live how we share our final cut pro project it's going to be super cool that's right and just uh i just want to say uh our first show last week despite a little bit of technical problems we had a great time we really appreciate everybody that came and watched we had a great turnout from folks from uh, all over the all over the world and uh so that's why we're back today and I'd also want to mention this this whole show is really uh, for you to answer your questions, engage in conversations. So there's a big old chat window that's very active right here um, that you can use to ask your questions. It can go by pretty quickly. If you want to make sure your question gets answered, there's a little dollar sign at the bottom down there. If you click on it, it's called Super Chat. And it allows you to make a, a small contribution to help support the show. And then your question will get pinned to the top. And the more you contribute, the longer it gets pinned there. Uh, you don't have to do that, but it's if you want to support the show, we would love that. Uh, and just you know, we'll we'll look at that. But we are going to get started first with this tip about a collaborative workflow, since so many people asked about it last week. So, uh, Steve, why don't you start us off on that process? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Mark lives in in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and I live in Arizona. And here's the key: in order for this to work both of us have to have the same media. In other words, I have the media on my local computer on my drive and he has the same media on his computer on his local drive or, or, or RAID or what have you, but that's, that's the key. Now I have a project right. that I've been editing, but Mark doesn't have the project. So we're gonna pick it up from that point. We're gonna jump into Final Cut, I'm gonna show you my project and then the process of how we share it. So let's, uh, let's go over to Final Cut. Okay, so here I am in Final Cut Pro 10. Now, before I actually show you my project, I'm gonna select the library and hit Command 4 to open the inspector, because I need you to show, I need to show you my library settings. So I'm gonna go over to click Modify Settings, and you'll notice that I have the media set for an external location. This isn't set in the library, and I can't stress this enough. If you're gonna do this, the media has to be outside your library. The other thing that I have set up is motion content. Normally, by default, all your motion content gets stored in the motion templates folder on your local drive, your user library. But I have it set for in the library. And this is very important when I pass the library over to Mark that the, any motion content shows up in his library. And uh, you'll see and that. Any, uh, just let me click. I was going to say any, any uh, custom motion content. Yes. Any custom motion count, they're very important. So I'm gonna click OK, or I'll click Cancel in this case. Now let me walk you through my project. So I have this project here of some, of some drone stuff that I shot in my hometown, of home city of uh, Los Angeles. And I have some 3D titles here. If I park my play hit there and hit Command R, you can see I have a, a speed ramp to the first clip. Um, I've got an adjustment layer, which is basically a title that allows me to apply a color grade over multiple clips. And I also have some transitions. It's a fairly simple project. And then, you know, I'm gonna give this to Mark and he's gonna take it over and do something to it and then send it back. So what I wanna do is create what's called a transfer library. Now, last week on our show, we talked about XML. And an XML is essentially a, basically a text list of your edits. It's like an edit decision list. It's primarily designed for sharing your projects with third-party applications. It's not really designed for sharing complex projects that have a lot of stuff going on like this one does. You really want to share a library. And this is where a transfer library comes in. A transfer library is simply a library that has a very small footprint that I can share with Mark. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to create that transfer library. I'm going to go up to the file menu, choose new, 
choose library and I'm going to call this transfer to mark and I'm going to save that on the desktop now it's saved on the desktop now before I do anything else I have to set up this transfer library so I'm going to select it in uh, the library browser and go over to modify settings and make sure that my media is set for external and I also want to set my motion content to in library and click OK that's very very important N now I want to Op find my project the one I'm currently work on working on it's called for prop stock that's what I've called the project and I'm going to drag it right out of my main library into this transfer library I'll get this dialog box and I'll just dismiss it because I don't have any optimized media or proxy media and that project now is transferred into my transfer library if I double click on it there's there's the project I should also point out and I if I go over to my titles You'll notice over here it says installed titles I go to transfer to mark this is a quick way to verify that my motion template was actually copied and you see it is so I wanted to point that out let me go back here now I'm ready to share this library to mark so what I'm going to do is right click and choose reveal in finder back out to the finder here I got all these windows open now close these and move these around so transfer there's my library now we said last week that you could share via Dropbox but Dropbox does not play well with libraries due to the fact that it's got a lot of Mac based architecture in it and whatnot it's best to zip it up so I'm going to right click on it choose um let's see compress and I just made a file now I want you to see this this file this zip file it's only 391 kilobytes super small so what I'm going to do is go over to Dropbox I created a folder called Final Cut Pro uh, transfer libraries I'm just going to drag that zip file right into that folder and Mark is uh, Mark is my shared he's my collaborator with that folder so he should get that zip file all right so if you can bring us back on screen for a moment guys so let's quickly recap the process so the media has to exist in both locations like it did and the media has to exist externally I, I create a transfer library not an XML I set up my library settings and then drag the project into it on the desktop or wherever it is I zip it up and drop it into Dropbox or whatever online collaboration platform you're using so now Mark's going to take over and show you what he's going to do on his end right so um, now I've gotten a notification from Dropbox that I have a new file so um, I'm going to share my screen here and um, if you look and see here uh, there is my uh, Dropbox in fact I'll command click so you can see that that came in from Steve It's a very very small file and what I'll do is drag it to my desktop to take it out of Dropbox and one thing with these transfer libraries this process um, I consider this kind of like an envelope to deliver something so I just use it to get the project out we don't actually do any editing with it we don't save it it's kind of a temporary file so I've taken it out I'll double click it to uh, to expand it and I'll get rid of the zipped copy before I open it I just want to show you in Final Cut Pro I have a this is my editing project so you know Steve could have sent me a hard drive with all this media or used Frame.io which we'll talk about in just a minute but I have all the same media that he does and my library also if I go to uh, modify settings just so you can see it a little more clearly it's uh, external so I have it in a folder with the same folder name doesn't need to be the same folder name the key is just that it's outside the library so uh, now what I'll go ahead and do is open up that transfer library and the first thing it does it gives me a warning and if you look at the tooltip that comes up when I move the pointer over that media pop-up menu you can see that it's looking for that same folder name but on Steve's volume you know in Prescott Arizona uh, if we had named our external drives with the same names you wouldn't need to do this step but that's often not convenient to do so I just want to show you that even if the drives don't have the same name all you need to do is choose the location of your media so I'm going to choose that and click OK the next thing I'm going to do is take this I don't care all the stuff's offline I don't care I just care about this project because if you noticed in my library let me select it for a minute I don't have a project I haven't built anything uh, I'm going to work on what Steve started so I'll go to the transfer library 
I'll select this project and drag it into the event in my library. I'll click OK, and I'll close that transfer library. And then I'll open this timeline, and boom, there it is. Because I have the same media, and I'm pointed to it, I don't need to relink. Uh, everything's here, all these clips are here. If I hit Command R, we can see the retiming came through. Let me turn off skimming with S there. These 3D titles came through, and this uh, custom motion template came through. Now, uh, all the products, all the plugins we sell through FX Factory are automatically managed. So with, with if you use FX Factory, you don't need to worry about storing the motion templates in the library. But if you've downloaded other third-party motion templates or you've made your own um, that aren't part of FX Factory, that's why we set the library to put those templates right inside. And we can see it came through and worked great. So I'm gonna make a few changes to this. Before I do, I'm gonna duplicate it so that I make changes to my own version. I'll call this uh, MS Edits, and I'll open it up and work on my copy. And the first thing, I, I like his, uh, he's done this color correction across these clips, but I, I am gonna change it a little bit here. I'm gonna go into the color curves where he made this change, and instead of this kind of sepia tone, I'm gonna go for a more kind of bluish tone to this clip, so I kinda like that. I don't know if I like that. I'm gonna leave him a little note about it. Um, I'll put a marker on here. Hope you like this color. All right. And then I also, I like this text here, but I'm gonna make a little change to the text here in terms of the, the skin or the texture that's applied. So rather than this brushed metal, I'm gonna go add some car paint and change what that looks like and kind of like that. And then the third thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a clip that Steve doesn't have. Um, we're starting off with the same media, but it's not unusual in collaborating on projects that you will each get new media and need to add it, and you each need access to it. So um, I'm gonna hit Command-I to import and locate this Phoenix, Arizona clip that Steve does not have. I'm gonna leave it in place, bring it in, and uh, there it is. Maybe set a little range on it. And then I'll put it right here. I'll just do a W for an insert edit and add that clip. Now, I'm done for now. I've done all the work I can do. I'm gonna send it back to Steve so he can keep working on it. Um, before I do, I know he doesn't have this clip. So to get him that clip, I'm gonna use Frame.io. So I'm gonna use the extension here and I'll open up the extension and there it is. And I know I just want this clip, so I'll drag it into this collection. And in fact, you notice we used Frame.io to share all these clips up front to get started since we didn't have a whole lot of clips there. So that's shared. I'll close that. And now to give the project to Steve, I'm just going to do exactly what he did. I'm going to very quickly make a new transfer library, and I'll call this one Transfer Steve, just to make it very obvious. And I will select my project here that I worked on and drag it in there. I'll say OK. Uh, in this case, I'm not adding any additional motion templates, but if I wanted to be careful, I could modify the settings and make sure the motion content is stored in the library. Great. I'm going to close that transfer library. I'm going to go back to the desktop. And here is the one that Steve sent me. I don't need that anymore. Now, the question is, where did I save that transfer library? I think I put it in the movies folder. Uh, there it is. I put it in the movies folder, so let's put it out on the desktop. Uh, I didn't pay attention to that. So there's the transfer library. I'm just like what Steve did. I'm going to compress it and throw that into uh, Dropbox. Let's make sure I'm on Dropbox, transfer libraries. There we are. Throw it into there to give it back to Steve. So uh, at that point, um, Steve, we can go back to, uh, to on camera here. Um, Steve will get two notifications. He'll get a notification from Dropbox that the project's ready, and also get a notice from Frame.io that there is a new clip for him. So Steve, why don't you show people uh, what's coming into your end? All right, yeah, this is, this is so cool, so much fun. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a look at what just happened. All right, so now I'm on my desktop and looking in Dropbox, there's the transfer to Steve Zip. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this transfer to Mark because it gets really confusing. You're dropping, <laughs> dropping all these libraries everywhere. So I'm gonna drag this zip file out of Dropbox 
move it out of Dropbox. I'm going to go ahead and go close this window, open up the zip file, extract it, and uh, I'm going to open up this transfer to Steve library by double clicking. And just like you saw on Mark's computer on his screen, um, I have to target the media folder in order to, to open the library. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, target the media folder. Click uh, OK. Now, all I care about, as Mark was saying, all I care about is the project. I don't care about all these offline clips. So I'm going to drag Mark's edit project into my Karma event. Click OK. And just so to keep my browser clean, I'm going to close these other libraries because it, it gets really confusing with all these libraries open. So I close them. I go into my Karma library. And look at There it is. Four prop stock mark edit. So I'm going to double click to open that. And look at that. Everything he did in the Bay Area where he is in Mill Valley shows up in my project, including that clip that he added that's offline. Well, that's not a problem because we have the Frame.io app extension. I just love this app extension. So I'm going to go ahead and open the Frame.io app, app extension. And there's the clip right there, Phoenix, Arizona, the one he uploaded right from his extension. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to choose import. And notice you can bring the quality, you can bring it in at full res or a, a, a low res version. I'm going to bring it in full res and I'm going to choose import. Now I'm going to target, it's asking me what destination, where do you want to store this, this imported file? Well, I want it to go in my drone media library. I'm going to click select. And I'm going to go ahead and close this Frame.io extension. And so I have one last step. I'm sure you see where this is going. I select the clip, file, relink files, locate all, locate file. It's already targeted my drone media drive with the clip in it. I click choose. I click relink. Bada bing, bada boom. I'm back in business. So I have the clip and I'm ready to go. Um, and so this is, um, this is the collaborative workflow. So, um, super easy workflow with Frame.io. Oh, it, I, I just can't even imagine, you know, life without Frame.io at this point, Mark, doing this collaborative back and forth. So it's super great. So anyway, I love it. And we, I just, I just want to mention that, um, uh, you know, so we've used this and, and, What's great about this show actually is when we were doing MapRec Studio, we had to kind of fake doing collaborative editing by pretending mm -hmm. we were in different locations. But now we really are and are able to do a live demonstration of exactly the process we use, which is, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I shall point out, in order for this to work, you, you both, both of you have to use the exact same version of Frame. I, we discovered yesterday, I, I was on an earlier version and it wasn't working. So that, well, that should go out that saying, but it's, yeah. it's good to remind, a good reminder. And, Thank you. And there's another thing that we talked about that somebody brought up in the chat window. If if Steve had used fonts that I don't have in his titles, he would need to give those to me uh, through another method, you know, email them to me or whatever, and I'd have to install those fonts. So that is yeah. that is one thing that you need to be aware of that that doesn't come through as any unique fonts. Yeah. All right. So now's the part of the show where we start taking some of your questions. And uh, thanks for uh, indulging us on that really cool tip. Hopefully sure. you'll find that useful. All right. So, um, okay. There's uh, there, Alex Goldner. Alex 4D. I see him right there. If Apple doesn't make this process easier, perhaps Frame.io mm -hmm. will add a share transfer project feature in next version of their workflow extension by dragging the project to their extension window. You know, that would be, that would be handy. Um, and by the way, uh, for those of you who have donated uh, via Super Chat, Stephen Nash, thank you. George, Chris Fenwick, guys, thanks, thanks a ton for that. Um, but yes, Alex 4D, I, I agree with you. Um, there should be an easier, a little bit easier way to do that, but yeah, we'll see. Okay, Stephen Nash. And Go ahead, Mark, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted, there's an earlier comment from Robin Kurtz that that says, hey, you could you could say full res media externally and have proxy mile, proxy media inside the library and just send the libraries back and forth. So here's here's why we didn't send our own libraries back and forth. This is a I'm glad he brought this up. 
usually in your own library, you're going to have many different projects. You're going to have backups of projects and other versions and strings outs and string outs and just a variety of things. The thing I love about the transfer library, you're sending one project. Mm -hmm. So instead of me sending this this project, because that's true, you could have a lightweight um, library, you just send the whole library back and forth, but then it can be very confusing when you open it up as what project to work on. With a transfer library, there's only one thing in it. There's one project, and that's the one thing you're trying to communicate to somebody else. And it, it just makes it a lot clearer and simpler. And, um, you know, I've worked on this project, uh, worked with this process of a transfer library with another editor uh, just over in the East Bays, but we were working on four hour timelines with seven camera multicam clips. And uh, it worked perfectly to do this. And I knew when he's sending me something, that single project, I didn't have to dig around for it. It just made it easy to, to locate. Yeah, well that shows you a Final Cut Pro and our workflow can handle huge projects with lots of clips, which is really good to know. So there's a question here from Stephen Nash. Uh, can adjustment layers be used above individual clips in the multi-cam angle editor? Um, yeah, it's a quick, yeah I, I don't see why it couldn't. Uh, might have to- Yeah, I don't uh, see why not. Yeah, I, I, if you think about it, a multi-cam clip is just a container that has you, you know clips inside it. So um, I don't think I have a project to show you, but that, that it should work. You should be able to take any uh, adjustment layer and, and, and put it inside a multi-cam clip. You know, maybe I'll test that and uh, get back to you on that. Okay, so another question here. Um, Mark M asks, what would you lose if you just exported an XML of the project to send off for sharing? Mark, you want to answer that question? Uh, say it again, sorry, I was looking up somebody no, else's yeah, question. Yeah, what, what, would, what would you lose if you were just sending an XML of the project? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. So um, it depends, but um, things that, that we've heard about that you have issues, and this is why we include in the project are uh, speed ramps, for one yep. thing, especially on certain types of media like um, uh, Ari Alexa footage, um, some red footage have some issues, uh, speed rants, and also titling, where you've got uh, sp specific titling attributes often don't pass through. And just to reiterate what Steve said, XML wasn't really designed to send projects back and forth. It was designed as in, to communicate to different apps. So producer's best friend or builder for transcription apps to send XML into Final Cut or sending Final Cut XML out to, um, you know, for, for Logic or Pro Tools or Resolve. It was really meant as an interchange format between applications rather than to send files. Now, if you just have a string out of clips, XML can work fine, but we like using this transfer library process because you know that the person on the other end is going to get exactly what you're looking at. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent answer. Um, okay. So by the way, for those of you who have, uh, have donated via super chat, thanks a lot. Um, great way to get your uh, answers or excuse me, questions pinned to the top is the, the super chat um, feature. Let's see. Justine Paula Robillard. I would love to donate legal regs prevent this not available in your country. Sorry about that, Justine. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Steve? Yes. Um, Justine also asked a question earlier about, there were two questions about Frame.io, and maybe I could share my screen for just a minute to show, um, to show this. Um, she asked about the Frame.io pricing. Uh, so I just brought up their website, so I don't know if you can uh, show this on the screen right now, but it really depends on what you do with them. There's a starter plan with three, pro three projects and 10 gigs of storage that's, uh, $19 a month, and it kind of goes up from there depending on the kind of plans. You can do monthly or annual. If you do annual subscriptions, it's nine bucks a month if you sign up for a year. So if you're doing a lot of collaboration, it's kind of a no-brainer because it's very easy to share um, you know, your media and your projects back and forth. But there's another question, do I have to use Frame.io? Could you just share the media some other way? And uh, yes, you, you can. You, you, know, you could send a drive with the media or use other transfer services just to get the media across. But for us, Frame.io is, is not just for, in fact, I would say sending media with Frame.io is, is a nice additional thing we use it for, but primarily we use it for sharing cuts and making comments on cuts and being able to uh, get feedback on completed projects. So that's kind of our, our rationale behind that. Okay. What do we have? Yeah, so um, anyway, so these questions are great. So 
we use this like mark was saying we use this process all the time frame io is just fantastic to have as a window uh, that pops right up um one of the things that uh, you might want to do if you use frame.io quite a bit is create a custom screen layout for frame.io and the nice thing about uh, that is in fact you want to go to my screen for a second is that uh, if I go to my workspaces um, you'll see I have a, a layout for frame.io if I select it I haven't checked I can open this up and it puts the frame.io right off to the side exactly where I want it and by the way I put a link down in the um, in the description field and it's a link to an article by our friend Peter Wiggins at, at fcp.co and he has a step-by-step -step how to do it so a uh, shout out there to Peter thanks for that so you find the link uh, think below um, Alex thank you for your uh, super chat, super chat donation by the way we love Alex 4d and uh, shout out to him he's got a great site bunch of free plugins you want to check out uh, really good ones too all right um, thanks Philip thanks for the donation I'm glad you're liking the training video we actually like this style of uh, showing a tip and interacting with the audience. this is something we couldn't do when we did Mac break we just posted the show and then we got to comment so it, it's the closest thing that I experienced to doing a real class and I used to do those quite a bit um, before we started ripple training I don't, I don't get out of my office much anymore so this is a great way to get in front of people okay so Wilhelm Conrad uh, Wilhelm said the frame IO destination disappears from time to time I reinstall it as per tutorials and then it disappears again what's up with that um yes uh, uh Wilhelm I I experienced the same thing and when what you're talking about if you go to my screen for a second so I can I can show the audience what, what he's referring to if you go to the uh share menu file cut pro uh say file share he's talking about these two frame IO uh x2 and x2 h264 and source if you don't see they see those it's there's a couple of ways you can reinstall uh, get them reinstalled you can go to frame io app if you've installed it let me see if i can find it here in frame io app i don't i'm not looking at the icon here maybe anyway uh you go to the app and reinstall them from the app or uh another way of doing that is going to the uh add destination Steve? Yeah. Yeah, you can you can reinstall the app just from the App Store. So the the, the Frame.io app will be in your applications folder, but you can just uh, you know delete it and go to the App Store to re-download it. Right. So I was going to say the other way is that you can add the destination uh, manually. You can simply go here. You can oh. add a uh, uh, you choose export file and you can create it. You can create it manually. You can add the destination and then you can choose audio video and then open with you choose Frame.io right there. And then so you're forcing it to use frame.io so this is the other way you can do it so uh Wilhelm I don't have a specific explanation as to why but every now and then they do but you can reinstall them or you can manually do what I just showed you in the destination window to solve that issue all right awesome okay so hey Steve um, yes go ahead I, is it okay if I answer a question here ah yep sure so um, I'm going to share my screen if we can cut to it um th there's been a little bit of comments about this idea of multicam and adjustment layers. So, um, if you uh, could, you see Steve? Can you tell if my screen is being shared? Yeah, there? that's my that's my daughter Katie. Yeah. So this is a this is a multicam edit, and the question is about adding adjustment layers within the angle editor. Um, the answer is you can't, but I don't really know why you'd want to. So what I'm going to do is double click on one of these clips to open the angle editor. And uh, there we have each of the angles, each of the separate cameras that were used in the shoot. So um, if I wanted to color correct, in fact, you can see uh, this one has already been color corrected with a colored work correction. I can turn it off and on there. The color correction applies to the entire angle. So that entire angle is color corrected. And when you're back in the multicam, it's corrected every instance of that clip when it appears in the multicam clip. So um, there's really no reason you'd want to add an adjustment layer. You may say, well, the camera turned on and off multiple times, so I actually have, in one angle, multiple clips. Okay, maybe you'd want to, but you actually can't. If I go to the Titles browser, I have our Ripple Tools Complete selected here, and there's our adjustment layer. We offer a free version of this adjustment layer by itself as well. You can get it from our website. But you actually can't uh, drag that and connect it to a clip in the angle editor. So if you did have multiple 
uh, clips in the same angle from the same camera, you just copy paste that correction. It's really not that big a deal. So um, anyway, that's what I would recommend. Uh, but the, the short answer is you actually can't add, um, you know, titles to as connected clips in the angle editor. That's it. Well, great tip. Um, thank you. Uh, man, it's really great to be able to jump in the project <laughs> and then show that. Um, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So um, what I want to do is like see the chat window. There was a question from Art, Art7. Is there a way to control the gamma on the materials exported from FCP10? Is there a way to export TIFF with gamma 2.4? Uh, from FCP 10. I have to round trip a project from FCP to resolve for DCP reasons. Um, so basically DCP, for those of you who don't know, is, is di di uh, digital cinema uh, projects or di digital cinema Package. projection. Base, base, you want to answer that, Mark? Uh, well, not really. It's, it's a digital cinema, digital cinema package. And package, it's, um, yes. The, the, the thing is, so Final Cut Pro is it's a color managed application, and normally it will, um, you know, obey the color sync function and uh, will will have correct color from application to application. Uh, the short answer is that I, there's no way that I know of to explicitly set a different gamma on something you're exporting different from the settings of your project. Now you can set your uh, project up to uh, have a color profile based on the color space, whether that's Rec. 709 or um, you know maybe HDR, uh, but you can't explicitly in Final Cut, as far as I know, change the gamma alone. Um, by the way, um, Peter Wiggins or somebody from Industrial Revolution, I, I think it's Peter, uh, had a very good comment about the zip file workflow. <laughs> did you notice that? He goes, "You don't I need did. to use Dropbox." I you did. Could. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Peter, you're being a smarty pants. All right. We we admit it. Uh, we could could have used that. In fact, I discovered that too. Let's demo it. Yeah. Well, you want to demo it? Yeah, I'll try it. Yeah, let's try it right now. So okay. I'm sc I'm screen sharing. Um, I want I want to wait a minute to make sure my screens come up because I know sometimes it takes a minute. So let me know, Steve, if it's up there. You're up. Okay, so I'm going to right click on this first uh, clip in the. Oh, and let me just show what I did, by the way. Um, here is my multicam edit, but I just double clicked one of these to open up, open up the multicam edit in the angle editor. And here's my first angle. I'll right click it, click it, and set a, a new uh, compound clip. There's my compound clip. So let's see. Uh, I'll go to the beginning and choose this adjustment later and hit Q. Uh, maybe I'm not understanding, but I'm not able to do that so maybe i'm not doing maybe peter can clarify what he means by that uh by, by I'm what not seeing it there you're talking about Make the, zip? the angle into a compound clip in the multicam ah, viewer right then open it up oh then open it up i see what he sees okay so let's let me let me redo that so there's my multicam i've got my compound clip there i'll double click to open it up add the adjustment layer inside it okay <laughs> So the adjustment layer is inside it. And uh, just to do, I'll do a quick correction on that adjustment layer just so we can see. I'll uh, go to exposure and increase contrast quite a bit. And then I'll go back out. And there you can see that adjustment layer is on there. So if I had multiple clips from the same camera in the angle, you could make a compound clip of all of them, open the compound clip, and I'll double click it again to open it and add your adjustment layer inside it. So that's great. Uh, I'm sure that was Peter Wiggins. Thank you for that. That was really great. All right, cool. Hey, we're learning stuff on this show. This is really great. In fact, um, to that point, Mark, um, it's really great about having a community out there that, that fills in the blanks. Look, we've been doing this a very long time, but we're not the end all be all. We don't have all the information. And what's really great about this community, it's like the, the I go back to my uh, Borg, like the Borg from Star Trek. We all have the information out there. And like last week, I made a point that you couldn't uh, create custom sh keyboard shortcuts for specific menu items in Final Cut Pro that weren't right. part of the command editor. But it turns out you can, and we heard from several of you that you can. And, uh, you know, uh, 
we, we have a link in the, in the comment section if you want to know how to do that. Anyway, but yeah, we're not going to, we may misspeak or we may not know, and we'll tell you if we don't know something, and feel free to correct us or maybe elaborate or amplify what we're saying. So we really yeah. appreciate it, really appreciate that. Hey, Matt, Sobel, problem is you can't see the clip. I agree, and, and actually I think this is an issue in general with uh, how Final Cut handles custom motion templates. If your custom motion template has a custom icon, like ours do, that icon ends up showing up when you put it over a clip in the uh, in that view of a compound clip or or in the browser, which is really annoying. So um, totally agree with you that, and in general, I probably wouldn't use that workflow unless I had a whole lot of clips because the camera's turned off and on all the time. But understand your point. So uh, what is, call, oh, you, you, go, you want to answer that? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I want to answer, it looks like M. Sharif Vlogs. He said that, uh, um, anyway, M. Sharif Vlogs, how can we import media in custom folder? Custom folder. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by custom folder. Maybe you could just I know, elaborate. I know what he means. I think I know what he means. It's just kind of like what we did. So if, if So what we did is we had our media external, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to import the the media, but keep it in a custom folder. So one option is you place all that media in your finder in the folder that you want, and then when you import it, you choose to leave in place. There's a leave in place checkbox when you import, done. The second option is you've already imported your media and it's inside the library and you'd like to move it out to a custom folder outside your library. Well, that's a media management operation and you just need to um, uh, do that in the library inspector. And uh, well, maybe I can show uh, that real quick. M. Sharif is saying he wants, he's being, how do you make a custom folder in library? That's what he's asking. Uh, so now I'm even more confused than the initial question he asked. Do but, that, I guess. Yeah, you, yeah. Why would you make a custom folder inside, inside your library? That's not a good idea to go into the library and make a custom folder. Uh, it's a self-contained database. Uh, App Funnel Cut Pro wants to see a certain type of database with a certain number of folders and a certain type of folder. So I, I if, if your suggestion is like custom folder in, in Final Cut inside the library itself, there's no way to do that. And I would definitely recommend not creating custom folders inside the library. Uh, custom folders are generally to be used or exclusively to be used outside the library. All right, so, um, <laughs> all right, so we have any questions here. Um, there, there's a question about what is Ripple Tools Complete? Or yes, or what is Ripple Complete? I, I assume, it said Ripple Complete, so I assume he meant Ripple yeah. Tools Complete. So basically that is a, a plugin that we create. Um, in fact, if you want to switch over my, uh, my screen here, and hopefully <laughs> I have it installed. I better have it installed, we make I've it, right, it, Mark? I've got it installed. Okay. I've got it here. Oh yeah, well, why don't you switch, uh, switch, we'll switch over to Mark's screen. Okay. <laughs> So I'm in the titles browser. Um, so Ripple Tools Complete is a plugin that we sell. So it gives us a chance to plug our plugin. So we just here, here it, it consists of all of these different title-based templates that allow you to do useful things in Final Cut, like this adjustment layer, which we also offer for free if you just want that. But we've got a cloner to clone out pixels, guides, and levelers that make it easy to uh, arrange things in your scene. You can obscure a face if you've got a, you can see it puts a little blur on a face that you can then track with keyframes. Vertical video is great if you've got, um, you know, stuff shot on a phone that somebody didn't, you know, held vertically. I won't say they didn't know what they're doing because everybody does it now anyway. Um, a bunch of looks, a bunch of multiple pur purpose tools like a shutter and a viewfinder, an extrude tool, a bunch of special effects, text effects and transformations like simple 3D or split screen. So um, anyway, if you're interested in that stuff, it's uh, at ripple-training.com, you look at our plugins, there's a little movie that plays what it is and shows you. It's, it's actually probably now our most popular plugin because it's a set of really useful tools that uh, you'll probably use just about on every project a little bit. So that's, that's my 30 second plug for uh, Ripple Tools Complete. Yeah, there was a question earlier about speed changes. Uh, I, I saw it come through the feed a second ago. Um, I don't see it on my screen anymore, but I think the question um, was relative to um, changing, going from a speed change to a freeze frame smoothly. And uh, I think I'll address that on, on Final Cut here. Um, 
I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and use this project that I'm using right now. Actually, let me let me get a clip that's that's clean. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this clip. Uh, let's see here. This is a good one. I'm gonna press E to add that to the end of my timeline, and you can see this is a really great candidate. For Steve, I'm not I'm not seeing your screen yet. Yeah, okay. I'm not you seeing your screen. To my screen, please. All right, hang on. There All we right. go. All right. Okay, so. With regard to speed changes, hopefully you're seeing this now. And as I was saying, this clip is a good candidate for speed change because typically with drone footage, depending on the speed at which you're you know, going around an object or film, filming something, you often want to speed this up. And or in this case, he wants to do a freeze frame. So uh, one way to do this would be, um, I'm gonna just hit Command R to bring up the, the, the speed dialog. And I find the smoothest, uh, speed ramp to a freeze frame is actually doing what's known as a hold frame. So with my playhead parked where I want the hold frame to go, I'll just go up to this little button right here that looks like a, a watch. And I'll click on that, and I'll do a and I'll and I'll do a hold frame or Shift H is the shortcut. And what it does is it adds a hold frame. So it goes in and then boop there. Okay. Now I think your question was really like, how can I do it and add a little ramp so it's not as you know, uh, almost like a fly hitting a piece of fly paper. <laughs> That's my analogy. Uh, I need it to ramp in. So if I double click right there at the boundary between the speed segments, I should get this little box that said speed transition. If I click that box, you'll notice I'll get this little bar. This is how I control the easing into that hold frame. So I've, I've already just done the easing now. So now all I need to do is adjust how much easing I want. So 100% and then it eases into the hold frame as opposed to doing just a hard cut. So that's how I would do it. I would use a hold frame and then add a little bit, easing, little bit of easing and you got a really nice transition to a freeze. So hopefully that answered your question. All right, I need to see the chat Very nice. guys. All right. Hey, okay, hey, we so. Have a, we have a a paid contribution here with a paid. question. I don't know if you yes. see that. Yep, I don't, I don't see it here. Go ahead. Oh, you don't? Oh, it's it's Ralph. It's Ralph. There Guggenheim. it is. I see. Hey, Ralph. thanks, Ralph. Hey, Ralph. I haven't seen Ralph for a long time. Um, Ralph is a great guy. Um, I import a layered Photoshop file and insert it as a clip in my timeline. I double click to open the PSD to see the layers, then add a fade to a layer and return to the timeline. I can no longer open that Photoshop clip. Why? Hmm. Uh, All right. You well, certainly you certainly know, should be able to. Yeah. Um, Go you ahead. Know what, that, that, you know what? I think what he's referring to there, there might be, there might be a bug um, that that's there. Let me uh, let me quickly uh, take a look um, to let's see here. I think. Let's see if I have. Um, All right. Let me. I'm pretty sure. Yes. I think I have a, a Photoshop file in this library. Let's let's take a quick look here. Hey, look at that! There's a Photoshop. There's excellent, a, excellent, right? Great. So so what he's saying, and look at this! I just landed right on a Photoshop layered file there. Isn't that great? So I'm gonna open this. <laughs> I'm gonna open this up, and essentially spill open the contents. And I'm gonna go ahead and make the. Um, I'm gonna make the. Uh, it's not as. There we go. I'm gonna, there we go. So you can see all the layers. So. What's nice about this is if I go to the view menu and choose on clip skimming, what's really great is I can skim and see all my individual Photoshop layers. And this is fantastic. So this, this is a restaurant in the Bay Area that Mark's sister runs called Laconda and we created, uh, created a logo for it. And let's say I wanna just fade in just the Locondo, the San Francisco. So what I'm gonna do, and this is his point, I want the Locondo layers right here. So I'm gonna select that layer or select the input, uh, right click on the layer. I'm gonna hit Command T to add a transition to that layer. So notice the Lakonda text fades up just on that layer. Now let's see if it's a bug or not. This is his question. I'm gonna back out and let's see what happens. Did it, does it fade up? Yeah, nope, fades up. So um, I don't know, <laughs> now, but it was now a... try to go. No, wait. Now, now yes. he, he said the problem is he can no longer go back inside the Photoshop uh, clip. So try double clicking uh, to go back go. inside it. All right. Here we go. Here we go. We're going in. Oh, 
You Whoa. can't double. Oh, oh, bad, bad. But wait, there's a way around this. You can. I, you, I don't know why you can't double click it, but you should go up to the clip menu and choose open clip. <laughs> Let's see if that works. Open clip. And I'm back inside the. So it there looks like go. double clicking can't work, but you could still get inside it if you need to. Okay. All right. Great. That was great. Hey, right. So you, you got a solution for him. That was you excellent. You got a solution. Thank hey, you thanks, very much, thanks for the for super company. chat. Thanks. Thank you. All right, man. Answering questions. Let's see here. Okay. Um, there's a couple of here from, from Remax Realty and one from Dave Chap Chapel Films. I'll go, I, I can't see the Remax question again. If you can scroll up a little bit for me. Okay. How do you I locate which third party effect is being used in the timeline? In FCP7, right click and show in the browser. Mark, uh, you work with more effects than I do. I don't know uh, if there's a way to do that quickly. Yeah, there's a, there's a third party tool called XFX um, <laughs> that will uh, analyze and show you the every third party effect and where it comes from. And uh, let me just see if I have it locally here. I'm not sure that I do. I don't think that I do. Um, I have it on my laptop, uh, but I don't have it here. But if you look up XFX, I'll, I'll at least see if I can get to the website and bring it up so I can show you. But it's a, it's a nice little tool that lets you see where things come from. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna have to. I don't see it right here, but I will. Uh, maybe it's called XFX. Somebody else will know in here. We did a MacBreak Studio on it uh, a while ago. Yeah, it's been a long time. No, XFX is Peter's uh, transitions. So I will find that out and I will, um, I'll, I'll post it on here or we'll bring it up in the next week because it's a great question. Sometimes you don't know where you got stuff from. Uh, you can always locate it uh, in the, let me, let me put it this way. Any, any third party title transition browser, uh, title transition defector generator are gonna be located in your motion templates folder. So user, movies, motion templates. So you can locate the actual project there. Um, although you may not remember where you got it from, but that's where it's located. In fact, let's let's just do that really quick um, to show people where these, if they don't and, know where all those things and, and live. Why, and while you're doing that, I wanted to answer a question really quick about gamma shifts. Uh, that was someone was, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, about why is there a gamma shift bringing a Photoshop file into, um, into Final Cut, I think Robin Kurtz's answer was use Affinity Photo. Well, that's one way to, uh, to deal with it. Um, I don't, well, first of all, I, I'm assuming you're working in RGB color space and not CMYK for one. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, maybe there's a slight one. I, I you know, if there's a slight gamma shift, I, I haven't noticed it. I'm not saying it's not there, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, may, maybe it requires a slight color correction. I, I, I'd have to demonstrate it. I'd have to look at that. But I, I don't have a problem with working in Photoshop and seeing an extreme. If it's a slight, I can deal with that because I'm everything's in RGB color space anyway and I make a tweak in RGB and I'm, I'm good. But yeah. I'd, have to, I'd have to do some more testing. So go ahead, Mark. You were going to pick you. up. Yeah, so I'm, um, I don't know if you can see my screen here. Um, let me know if you can. Yep. But, okay, so I just wanted to say if any any titles, transitions, effects, or generators that are not built into Final Cut uh, directly, if you go to your user's movie folder and then to this motion templates folder, uh, they'll be in here. So, for instance, if I open titles, in, in, and I have a lot because <laughs> I've got our you know all our Ripple um, plugins and a couple other ones as well. So this is where they're all located. Uh, and in fact, just while I'm in here, I'll show you what I also do. I have something called moved motion templates because sometimes I'll move some out. If I'm showing my screen, I'm teaching and I don't want to see all them. If they're FX factory, just to, um, if they are FX factory templates, uh, you don't need to, to deal with this because if you run the FX factory application, all your installed templates are listed right there and you can uninstall them by clicking here very easily, or you can even um, uninstall all of them. You can disable all your trial products um, and you can locate the products in the find or whatever right within the FX factory application. So I don't know if that answers that person's question, but in case folks didn't know, that's where everything uh, gets stored. Right. So there was a, a super chat earlier that I think, I don't wanna make sure we didn't miss there, Thomas Rodriguez. Oh, thanks Tom, thanks, thanks for the uh, donation, really appreciate it. Excellent. Um, 
Robin mentions that Affinity Photo actually has an explicit export for FCP setting. I, I didn't know that, Robin. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, and it does seem that there is a slight gamut shift using sRGB. Um, okay, well, uh, nothing. No, there's no nothing that I know of what to do. I just bring in the Photoshop and, and adjust it, like I was saying. Oh, William Buchanan says XFX Handler is the Thank name you. Of it. That's it. Thanks, William. That's yes. awesome. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Peter Rude asks, is there anything in Final Cut Pretend that can help with choppy pan shots? The ca my camera seems to record pan shots that look choppy. They look fine in the camera, so I need a fix. Um, I guess a, I, I guess I'd wonder what you meant by choppy. So you're panning, and then when you play the file back on the computer, it's not smooth. It's kind of doing this. Um, and without seeing the projects, hard to know. So maybe you want to, you know, you could zip zip up the library with just that project. We'll take a look at it. Could be a frame rate discrepancy. I don't know what frame rate you're shooting at versus the project frame rate you're putting it in. A lot of times the choppiness is, could be, you know, again, frame rate mismatch between the clip you're adding and the project that you're putting it into. Um, the choppy playback could also be the codec. Uh, if you're using a, um, a clip from a camera that's, you know, using an H.264, an MP4 container with H.264 media in it, um, and you're playing it off, you know, maybe a piece of media that hasn't been imported yet. There, there could be a number of reasons why it's choppy. Um, it sounds like, let's just assume for a minute that the clip is cool. I would open it up first in QuickTime, drag it off your media card, play it in the QuickTime player, forget Final Cut, does it play choppy? right off of your fastest drive. And if it does, then there might be something other, something else going on there. So anyway, did I did my uh, the best I can with that question. Right. So I, Steve, I've got, uh, let me yeah. respond. John, John says, how do you cut up one long piece of film and put the parts into the browser? Um, so, uh, Let's let's address that. It, it, let's. But first, I want to I want to show him something. If if we can share my screen for a minute, because um, yeah. I think yep. this would be really helpful. Um, it, see, let me so if you can see my screen there. Yep, we can. Okay, so I'm in the Apple website, and I'm at uh, I'm in the Final Cut Pro page of the Apple website, and if I go to resources, um, in resources under there's Ripple training right here under resources on the Apple website, and it says get started in Final Cut Pro. And there's, we've got eight free lessons. Like if you're new to Final Cut, um, you know, we'd love you to buy our tutorials, of course, but we also have kind of a get it started to eight free lessons that go over the basics of how to work with Final Cut. And especially if you're coming from another application, I highly recommend you look through these because you can't just necessarily apply what you know in other applications because Final Cut does a few things differently. So um, that, that was the first point I wanted to make. Um, in terms of importing just the parts of a clip, I'm back in Final Cut. And a couple things you can do is if you do command I to import and you select a clip and if you don't want to import, I'm going to hit S to turn off. I'm going to shift S to turn off audio skimming just so we don't have any sound coming in there. Um, you know, you can select a range to import with I and O. Actually, I can't do it on that clip because um, these clips are. I think, can I ask a question, Mark? Did, was he asking yeah. about clips that have already been imported? Were you, were I, you just- I, I don't or, think so. I don't think so. He said, he said, he can clarify it for us, but he said, how do you cut up one long piece of film and put the parts into the browser? So right. he didn't say into the timeline. So I'm assuming he's trying to import just parts of a clip. So um, let me just navigate oh, the reason, to- The reason um, why you can't, by the way, the reason why you couldn't send in outputs because yeah. that was .mov, that wasn't part of the original. Uh, you need to do it on a camera archive or a camera original media so that you can do the, you know, the multiple right. selection ranges. Um, so, but my point was if the-, and if you the should, Can you explain that a little more to people? Because I think that's really important for folks to understand is, is um, if you've got clips by themselves, once they're imported, you have to import the entire clip. Yeah, um, look at the only look way at your import. screen. Yeah, your screen yeah. there is those are MOVs and they've they're they're no longer part of a media card anymore. So Final Cut needs to bring in the entire clip, and that's a really important distinction. 
uh, that's why it's so important to to either create a camera archive or import off the original camera card because all of the metadata that's associated with that card gets maintained in the import window and then you can actually make s selections for your clip otherwise you won't be able to do that so uh, essentially what i'm saying is if you want to make multiple selections and and take this long drone clip, like typically you shoot drone footage, you know, 15 minutes at a time. You're not gonna use all that. You wanna just use parts of it. So in this case, you wanna import off the original camera media so then you can pick your selects. If you don't do it that way, the other way to do it is use rejects. If I can, uh, if you cut to my uh, screen just for a, for a moment. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so here I have this drone. These clips are fairly short. So I'm gonna, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm going to skim, I'm going to set in, actually, um, so what you can do is like all the pieces I don't want. So like I don't want that piece right there. And then I'm going to use, um, hold the command key down and I'm going to make another selection. So I have two selections. I don't want these two pieces here. I don't want this piece here. So now that everything outside those selection ranges I want and everything inside the selection ranges I don't want. I know that sounds weird. But now, if I go up to the, let's see, um, actually, uh, mark, to where I forget, you know, so I use the keyboard shortcuts. You ever use a keyboard shortcut so much that you actually forget where the menu item is? So what I wanna do is reject, a so delete key. So it rejects those, but then what it leaves me with are just the pieces I want. So if I go to rejected, notice if I go to rejected, the rejected are just those pieces that were in the range. And that's really important, Re rejection, uh, rejection meta metadata is really really useful um, so you end up with just the pieces and everything else is hidden so hey Steve I don't know yeah. if you have access to an to anything that's on a camera card or an archive there to show you know shift command I and shift command O to do multiple importing multiple selections actually I'm glad you asked I do there it is so I have a camera archive right there and we'll see if I can I, I, I can access it so I'm gonna go um, Press Command I to open the import window, and let's see here. Um, oh, I need to go to. I got to navigate to the desktop, and then I got to. I got to remember where I put this thing. You know what? There's a. There should be a faster way to do this. Um, let's see. Let me try Can this. Can you drag? I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, right I'm gonna hold this. I'm gonna. I hold this, and then Command Tab back over to Final Cut, and then drag that right into the Favorites folder. There it is. That's the way to do there it. We go. So, Beautiful. so now I have, so now I have the, this is a camera archive and it was created from the original camera media from my Canon 5D. So if I can now, I could select any of these and now I can then make separate selections. So if I drag there and I hold down the command key there, now I drag, so now I have three separate selections. So when I click import, it'll only bring in those pieces and I can also Fantastic. use shortcuts for this. So option X. Uh, Mark's point was, I don't even have to use, I could just press I and, I'm, and play this in real time. So I'm play, press O, and then I hit, and I'm watching this in real time. Command shift I, command shift O, command shift I, command shift O. And so you get the picture, I can watch it and add all these ranges at the same time. And then when I click import selected, it will only bring the content within those selected ranges. Nice. Nice. Hey, Steve, right. is can I share my screen to answer like two questions at once here? I think this, this might have to be the last question we answer yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, let me go. I always have to click two buttons to share my screen. Okay, let mm -hmm. me know if it's coming through there. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay, great. So there's a question about F XFX Handler earlier and somebody that popped in with the name. So thank you for doing that. I just want to show you this is the, the website spherico.com. And there's two reasons I'm showing this. One is to show where XF, XFX Handler is. This is what will show you uh, where all your third-party effects are coming from, especially if they're offline or missing. Oh, I actually have a, a quote from me in there. <laughs> I didn't know that. So this, <laughs> this tool is free. It's free, okay? It's a great tool. And the second thing is Tom Wolski made a comment about, hey, if you want to import ranges of clips that are not part of a camera card or a camera archive, you can still do it. Because if you use this product on his websites, same website, Spherico, there's a product called um, 
virtual cam card. And I'm <laughs> wow. looking for it on his website now for his, where his products are. Uh, I don't see it on here. Well, Alex, Alex, says, to, Alex Goldner says there's no link. They don't have a link to this tool. Oh, there it is. No, it's right there. Virtual cam card right there. Okay. Oh, I just downloaded. It just, I clicked in a download. So it creates a sparse bundle as a folder structure, like a standard camera card. See that right there? So that way, if you've already downloaded or copied a very, very long clip and you only want to import little bits of it, this is a way you can do it. So uh, Tom, thank you very much, Tom Wolski, for bringing that up. Just wanted to communicate that. All right. So um, I think, uh, yeah, we're at 11 o'clock here. Yep. So. Uh, Everybody, thank you very, very much for joining the show. This was great, really, really fun to do. And technology seemed to work pretty well. Uh, if you've got comments about technical issues, audio, video, I'm on, I noticed one person mentioned that the, the resolution didn't seem quite high enough. Could you go up from 720p? We actually can't because the Blackmagic Web Presenter software is currently limited, or the hardware box is limited to that. Um, but let us know. Let us know if it looked and sounded good. Let us know if there's issues. Um, we'll try to answer other questions, and we'll, you know, take your questions we missed into account um, next week. Yeah, and uh, get the word out. Uh, we really appreciate the your your support. And I think Mark said we had a great time. So next week we'll try to outdo ourselves with the next tip. We might have separate tips next week. And and by the way, you could you could support via comments right down below. When this this is going to okay. go live the feed, the good post point, show. Good point. That, yeah, so put, put your comments in and we'll read them and you know, integrate them into the next show. So we like the uh, community aspect of Ripple Live. So if you want that, to be notified, yeah. I'm sorry, I just want to say, if you want to be notified, make sure to subscribe, subscribe to our channel so you get notified when we go live again. And you also get to notice when this uh, show is recorded and available, which will happen shortly. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week on the third edition of Ripple Live. Thanks for watching. Thanks, you guys.